I used to work with Databricks, implementing it from scratch. I think I started to work with Databricks since 2021, then I joined Microsoft. Before Priora, I was in Amazon and I used Apache Spark, mostly on uh, Elastic Map Reduce on top of, basically just, just the Spark on top of it, and did a bit of glue, AWS glue. The Databricks projects, it was the idea to leverage the Delta Lake it's exactly the time then we had GDPR compliance and traditional data lake with parquet files basically didn't work as expected. In Amazon, we had the challenges because, okay, we have the huge data lake as an alternative to traditional data warehouse with Redshift. And then you have to delete particular customer ID based on the signal you are getting. And you couldn't just do like delete operation from like big data lake. Many workarounds, either like reload the data or keep last 90 days or trying to partition somehow in a weird way. So Data Lake was very promising and I started to exploring this. And then I joined Microsoft. Basically, they had even worse. They didn't care about GDPR there. They have exemption. Their solution was HD Insight. It's basically managed Hadoop on Azure uh, with the Hive, taking the raw data. Most of the data were like JSON logs or events. In the storage account so the hive jobs process these and generated uh, staging tables in hive semi-structure in parquet and then in sql server that was deployed on premise it had the external tables defined in sql server basically able to read uh, those hive metadata and then using integration service also on premise uh, to build the fact table using traditional dimensional modeling Yeah, it's SQL Server. And then we connected the, connected the Power BI and Tableau for reporting. The obvious challenges, are, yeah, you, you split between on-premise and the cloud, and then you're using HD Insights and Hive and then SQL Server integration service. Yeah, the challenges for HD Insights and Hive in particular, so sometimes, especially then the game launch, you have way more events. As a result, you need to scale up your Hadoop cluster. It's not elastic. Basically, you have to shut down the cluster, change the configurations and start with the bigger nodes or more nodes. You couldn't just elastically adding more nodes and scale up and down. So some downtime. And also it was the single compute cluster. So if you have to do analysts, need to use Hive to query the data, there's pipelines for ETL. All of these, like it's like concurrency issue battling for compute power of HD inside the, the single like point for connecting. Databricks solving all of this. Uh, so the, the goal was, okay, one is to move everything to the cloud on the single platform. The second is to try Delta Lake. It, it wasn't that popular trying the Delta Lake and trying to migrate everything to Delta Lake. Take one, one pipeline end to end and move everything to Databricks and Delta Lake. So, I, and I was working on this my almost two years. First I did the POC and then the PRC was successful, and then we did migrations for everything else. We talk about petabyte size. The Microsoft, the biggest data lake inside Microsoft was like around like 15 petabytes, but it's like all Microsoft data. The game still metrics, terabyte size, maybe like hundreds of terabytes could be like total for all ga game games because different titles they have different telemetry period of time then game is launch and they keep playing and from this big um, microsoft data lake i extracted only data i need so i need the particular xbox telemetry and some sales data i just extract and augment my my data lake that i built in um, databricks The team was pretty small. There was like two data engineers, uh, two analysts, one data scientist and the manager. For me, I'm, I'm completely independent in terms of understand the requirements. Uh, for me, it's important to understand where is the data coming from, what transformation should apply and where the data should be reported. If this is any kind of BI tools, then I can build prototype of the dashboard and, and communicate back with like stakeholders just to, to make sure that data makes sense. I usually don't do 
dives deep in the business requirements in terms of like okay if it's any complicated I know I have many examples for the example for finance metrics different uh, subscription metrics they have complex logic I usually work with someone who can tell me exactly what's the logic that they, I can apply in the code and then someone who can verify that this logic result is match and then I can build pipelines yeah yeah yeah, I'm, I'm aware of churn and I think for all companies that I was working, uh, the churn analysis or like customer analytics was part of the job. For me, I can come up with more like ad hoc analysis and I did this not for Xbox, I did this for Amazon and mostly for like hackathon projects because as a data engineer it wasn't my primary, I'm more out of curiosity. In the past I also worked in, with the marketing team in Europe. I actually was the marketing analyst, so it was my primary objectives, doing the customer analytics, the churn, ana churn analysis, cohorts, and like attribution models, where I actually take the data and trying to come up with the business recommendations. If I will work on the churn analysis, I will focus on activity, starting from defining how we define the active user and then define the boundaries for active user. Okay, if the user is not active, when we can count this as a charm, like then it's like 30 days not active, 60 days not active. I couldn't come up with those. I can just come up with assumptions, but I need to know, do we want if the user stop paying us or the user just stop playing? So, because there are key questions I need to ask, but with those assumptions, I can just query the data and profile the data and, and say, hey, this is the list of the users who is not with some predefined assumptions. So this is the list of the users who st stop using the service. I consider them churn. So, and basically my rule of churning 30 days, not active. So I consider this user a churn. And then what's important to prevent churning? If I take this group of users who is churning now and I trying to see the patterns what is before the churn like? What's the activity look like before the churn? If I start diving deep, I can see, oh, actually, in the time that they are active, just month before, I can see just the drop in activity, or maybe they stop playing online game, or maybe start using different features, or just, they just change the pattern. That's probably a good sign for me. This is the target group of users that we can communicate somehow for the marketing, or maybe send them some kind of incentive. In my expectations as a data engineer, yeah, I can do this, all of this, and I understand this. In my understanding, this is, should be done by product managers or like some kind of analyst. Yeah, t totally. I think here um, there are two answers, right? The, the one answer to, to please you, I, I know how to tell it to make, for example, happy doing it to you and what's the expectation. But I think there could be two types of companies. For example, it's the small startup. They, you actually, like every single person have the impact. So working in startup, I, I understand that I have impact and I can do anything proactively and see the impact of the business. But for example, then I working in the huge corporations, any financial institutions or any like insurance company or just the huge company there, I don't know, you have teams of data engineering with 15 people, then you have data of analysts in other 15 people, you have data of team of data science and other 15 people. E even there, my proactive position, my manager can tell me, Dimitri, you, you shouldn't do this. Like your area of responsibility is the pipeline. And I'm mentioning about enterprise company. So then you work for enterprise company, read the boundaries is very clear. I had some extreme cases then I was working on the staging data pipelines. It was Canadian telecom company. I was working just the staging uh, pipelines. I, I didn't know who end users. I had a hard time to ask their feedback or even find who is end users. In many cases, I was building pipelines. We, I even didn't understand what kind of data is this. It's not because I was lazy to dive deep my manager prevent the team to doing such work. They trying to keep you on the really narrow focus just to make sure the pipeline is working. You process the JSONs, parquet files, everything works smooth. So that's it. So it, it depends on the team.
I like to ask the questions. So for anything I, I touch and work, I always ask the questions, why? Why we have, I often do, because usually when I start to work from the, any projects, especially if not building from scratch, I prefer to document uh, top to down. So starting from dashboards and basically document from dashboards to the source, all tables, all transformations, where's the data coming from, and then get list of the data sources, list of the transformations, in DT5, for example, it could be some data sources we don't use. It could be some data source that duplicate the same thing and, and so on. That's the, I found the best way to quickly understand how things work is just to document top to down and then ask the question for clarifications. And also you will spot some things that's odd in this solution. Usually then many teams or many people work on the solution over the time or some legacy things. The people forgot about what they add there and why. So this kind of fresh documentations it help everyone to be on the same page. No, it's still the same. Yeah, date lineage, but I it's basically I do it manually myself. Yeah. With data things and most of the work I do as a data engineer, I'm using mostly Python. I try to avoid to use any classes, so just the functions. The only classes I encountered, then I work with open source and usually not to writing, but mo mostly like understanding the logic or with open source, often with some issues that I need to troubleshoot that some code of not working. I had examples with Miltana or Arobyte as the things I use for open source as the data ingestion. It's just to answer the classes. So I, I'm not a fan of using classes. And another thing I think in, Using the classes, basically you, you can like build the whole package that add complexity to the projects and it's harder for the rest of the team to be on the same page. I try to stick down to the functions and uh, in terms of Databricks, all solutions I've built, most of the functions, they could be one function is read, in other functions is write, with some functions uh, for data transformations that could be easily reused and this is the primary goal of the function just to try to reuse code as much as possible in my databricks solution i have dedicated uh, notebooks with the functions that i can preload for the my actual notebook with the data transformations and also additional things uh, to like for example for logging or like sampling data so this all could be pre-built the functions working databricks especially you don't require to to use the classes they could, there was one instance to use the classes with the variables just to make sure there is no any collision because we have multiple game titles and they can run at the same time. So just to avoid any collision with the variables, that's why the variables that I can call inside the class. But it was very simple just to decouple things from, from different projects. Uh, in terms of data frames, so in terms of PySpark and SQL, I am against to using Spark SQL. For me, the Spark is a primary, is either Scala or PySpark, give you full flexibility. But I understand nowadays, the Spark SQL is basically give you the same functionality as the PySpark. In my ideal world, mostly for all transformations and all kinds of data transformations, if we talk about medallion architecture, we have bronze, silver. So bronze and silver layers, they've done in, uh, in PySpark code. And then for the fact tables, it is fine to to have the Spark SQL, and it doesn't really matter at this point of time. And I might prefer in my project I use the Spark SQL with the idea that it will be helpful for analysts, people who actually they use the Power BI to connect the tables. They might to see any kind of logics, and yeah, they're just helpful for them. My preference for Spark is a PySpark. The Spark is very helpful. You can rely on the Spark metrics and see the actual query execution plan to see what's happening and what is particular operations. It might be memory spill. There could be the cluster size usually is predefined the, and it might be the situation you can just observe that the memory that cluster is using is not enough to process. The incoming date volume is pretty big and it caused the performance degradation. My general rule, I go to Spark metrics, see the job stages and tasks 
we see what's the volume of data input and I can compare the same plan with successful run. If we talk about Databricks and jobs in particular, where I can always compare a successful job and the stacked or failed job to see that they have at least the same input volume of data. Another thing could be is a concurrency run. If I using the shared cluster, I need to make sure that the cluster is not obligated by you know, end users or BI tools or any kind of cross joins that, that cause the performance issue. The plan should tell the story, where is the bottleneck? Yeah, I think uh, it depends what's the issue. The simplest solution, especially in the cloud, you just double, double the cluster size, so double the node number, or not the double, just add additional nodes. Risk could be the issue in the actual code execution. Example with the shuffling, right? If you if you see in the plan that you start shuffling the data between uh, Spark nodes, that obvious a problem. That in the task here, how you gonna to prevent these shuffle operations? That's why I mentioned that it's important to find actual the root cause of a particular task. What's happening? And if you see this either shuffle operation, you try for example you join huge table with another huge table together and you see they start replicating it using the network among all nodes, then you need to do some kind of optimizations, maybe decouple your jobs into smaller, maybe decrease the number of the um, volume of data, maybe check that you actually leverage the partitions because ideally data should be partitioned and you just need to make sure that you use partition. Those techniques that I can try. But first I need to find what, what causing the problem, like what, what exactly? The thing is happening, I think it calls data skew. Then uh, we, we have the values that like basically skew towards one. So, and I think to, to avoid this, in, in Databricks and Spark, like, we can use the bucketing technique, trying to, to bucket the values. And, and the second table is like, in terms of the size, the second table is like also a huge one. Definitely for the second table, I want to cache it and replicate, make sure this, this is replicate among all nodes. And just as a first step and see, uh, is that, do I have any improvements? The second thing, I can start bucketing the values, not by actual ID. So we have 95% of the same value maybe I have the options to use any other column to split among uh, among other nodes and, and help me to equally distribute the data, not just using the this ID because it, yeah with this ID it will skew this skew one node will have all the values. My goal will be to equally spread the data among the nodes. The second tables should be cached in memory on all nodes. It will help me to do the join operation inside the node, and then I can reduce to the result. The data frame can cache. So there is the command for data frame caching so that I can just pre-cache before. I assume as soon as I cache, it, it should be available on all, all nodes in memory. The Databricks project was one of them. And I think the challenge was because I never worked with Databricks. I never work uh, with Delta Lake. I used to work with traditional data warehouse and I mostly use Spark as a complementary tool for process the volume of data that didn't fit my Redshift data warehouse. For me, it was hard to make the transition from data warehouse to lake house. So, and I think it's, it's very complicated questions for data engineers who never work with Spark what's the difference between like, for example, lake house and data warehouse from internals. This POC took me a while, not, not because it was complicated, just because I, I couldn't long time understand the difference between data warehouse and how I can transfer all my existing experience to building cloud data warehouse into this new paradigm of lake house. Maybe it took even six months to fully realize how these things works and what's the difference. And this definitely gave me like some sort of accomplishments. The basically I was in gaming studio, I was one of the first who starting leverage Azure Databricks, do this kind of migrations. It was pretty new, the Delta Lake approach. And I was bet on this and it was 
really nice that it worked out and then I helped other teams to get knowledge and sharing knowledge across other uh, Microsoft gaming studios how this could be done by spark transformations it, it wasn't big deal yeah the biggest problem for me was just to understand what's the difference from data warehouse and and how I can shift from cloud data warehouse to this like paradigm First of all, in terms of slowly change dimensions, I usually leverage only two types. It's type one and type two. Just recently, I had example of building the ETL pipeline, replicate Azure SQL tables into Snowflake. I use data factory. So it means I basically just had the SQL queries defined inside data factory. So the first question I had, so we, we had the table users and this tape I should replicate into Snowflake staging. First of all, I don't want to rewrite this table every day. So I want to have some kind of like incremental changes. The team, backend team told me I can use update timestamp and create a timestamp. That makes sense. Now I can load the incremental things. The challenge is assuming I already load the user into Snowflake. Next day, this user got update and basically update timestamp is updated. It means I will load this user again and we might change any, any attribute of this user. The question is a data engineer I have, how I should handle the changes. In this particular case, we agree that I basically will keep up to date user page type one. I just make sure if the user change based on the primary key like user id is a change i will just update the same in snowflake so i basically use absurd command it's it will update the user id my primary key is a user id this is clear type one dimension this doesn't handle any deletes assuming the source table will delete the user this user will still be in uh, snowflake in case if i want to handle deletes i probably need to go with snapshots and basically every day get the full snapshot of my user's table from Azure SQL and then compare it uh, with what I have in Snowflake. And then if I can see that the, the user ID is missing from the Azure SQL, then I can mark this user as a deleted. All those tables are pretty big, so it is expensive and we just agree to keep it. Another parameter for this kind of work that I usually consider is the cost and in cloud, computing, the moving things around, the running your pipelines daily could be quite expensive. That's why it's like trade-off. You don't have delete user flag, and I assume that all users we have just single instance of user. So this could be the case that the product team, for example, we have another table with the products. The same idea, the product ID, I can re completely replicate, but the product team can tell me, you know, we actually want to handle product names history. We want in our reporting, you want to have the, the better over the time, we want to better report on the product names. And if the product in the last year, the product name has the different name, we want to see it. In this case, this is slowly changed dimension type two. Then I actually, for every record, the change, I will have a flag, is it current value for the dimensions and also I will have the date start and date end. Whenever I will merge this with the fact table, I will use not only surrogate key or, or just the key, uh, the product ID, I also need to specify the date. In I assume in my fact table, I have the date, sales date. My sales date should be in the range of the product name. This makes sure that my history is consistent. This is the two most popular things and this really depends on their use cases. In terms of the key, for sure, for everything, we can build like surrogate key just using simple uh, sequence. And it's especially important if we work with multiple instances of the source databases that could be split among several regions. It means that user ID is unique inside the regions, but they can overlap between the regions. You couldn't rely on the, this natural key. It means you need to come up with a surrogate key that will be unique across all regions. 
in one case then I had this example I actually leveraged the user UID this column was already pre-built for me by a backend team and I can use this as a unique key across everything and it used for the join the probably downside of this this UID is not integer and honestly I don't know the how the, the performance violations if I will just using UID for the join versus like integer and you know with cloud computing it's usually like if it's not perform enough you just increase the size till the moment the cost is too higher and you start diving into to see how you can cut the cost yeah I think because I used to work a lot with dbt framework this is like a sql framework it's quite popular for sql data warehouse like snowflake redshift like bigquery all those things it's just alternative to spark and databricks dbt only handles your transformations so you need somehow push the data into your cloud data warehouse and then you can leverage dbt to have the layers silver bronze gold layers and then you have SQL transformations, and then you can leverage the DAC. So it's just dependency between SQL executions. The idea that this framework gives you ability to run the test for every query. So every query, is, it could be just ETL job or data transformations. And for every query, you can define the tests. The two, the most common and mandatory tests are not null and unique key. It means for every table, you define the unique key, you have out of the box the unique test it means uh, if you define the proper unique key as soon as you refresh the table you run the unique test it will just again generate under hood the sql that makes sure that table doesn't have any duplicates this will help you to prevent those kinds of issues and you can define any kind of test if you have some product categories you can define list of accepted values uh, for the product categories everything that's outside of this you can just discard or you can completely stop the whole data pipeline and get notifications you have ability to use custom tests for the data i think in spark i use either custom defined by spark jobs that are doing the same validations for me if i know that my primary key i can define that with no any dupes if i know that it's revenue or it should be more than zero or I shouldn't have any null. So it's all coming to the rules that I can define. Working in this PySpark work or Spark, we usually leverage PyTest or like different Python assertions. It's the same idea. In dbt, you, you define those tests. It's the same as in PySpark, you define your tests with assertions. It's fail, so I'll just give you the warning. I need to find the way how to work with the descriptions. It probably won't be 100% accurate. There are packages that, um, I forgot exactly the name of libraries. I did the same analysis on the book titles, basically trying to identify that the book titles, basically you convert it to some like math things, and then you're trying to measure the distance between them. And then with some kind of approximation, you can come up that those probably the same just because in, in the math world like the distance between them is close enough that we can treat as they are the same i still thinking about not sure how to apply but the chat gpt api or any lms api could handle the data quality pretty well for any questions that you have like free text or even like just api call result payload you can fit to lm model and it will parse it for you and do all kinds of similarity tests. That would be nice. In the past, we just used this, like, this similarity test, yeah. I even did this in the Hive on using Elastic Map Reduce and Hive. So Hive having those libraries. Yeah, I try to understand what, what the company is doing. Like, uh, I've got the sense that it's some kind of like consulting company based based in Argentina headquarter, but having customers around, like in North America. What your particular role? You're working on like single customer or like multiple customer at the same time. And they're using Databricks and what, what's the public cloud? Yeah, I think I'm good. Yeah, everything else is clear.
yeah thank you very much for for the questions yeah i like them